Steve, can you hear me? Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I would recommend that you turn off your video at this point and then change your uh, view to speaker. So we don't, you don't see all those people on the side. If you have comments uh, during the presentation, put them in the chat. I'm sorry, go ahead and Christine. Right. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Steve. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Mecklenburg Audubon President Steve Coggin. Thanks for coming to our February meeting. Christine is gonna start the slideshow and tonight we have Judy Mullis. She'll be introduced a little bit later, but she's gonna speak with us about mushrooms. All right. We are hosting the North Carolina Audubon Summit here April 21st through 24th. This is originally scheduled for 2020 and here it is 2022. And we're going to pull it off this year. And we're still looking for volunteers. So if you'd like to do that, please let us know. Yeah, any help would be welcome. And it's going to be great fun. And we're really looking forward to having um, chapter members from around the state come, come visit us so we can show off our birds. Uh, I'm going to share some pictures from members. And um, this first batch is some shots from early January. Um, the group went to, to Huntington Beach State Park. Um, that's a trip that Mass uh, regularly does twice a year, usually. And um, this January trip was a, a great group. And um, on the bottom left, you'll see some pictures by Bud Younce. He's one of our members. And uh, we saw lots of night herons. Um, so uh, the, a juvenile and a, and a black, is the one on, black crown night heron on the left and a juvenile yellow crowned on the right. Um, and we saw the, the, uh, the reeds were just full, filled with them. We saw lots of those. Um, there I am in the middle on the top. Um, that was my first experience with starfish. I, or, or sea, correct sea me, Steve? Sea stars, right, technical name, not really starfish. Um, and there were a number yeah, of them fish, in this little, star. this little narrow um, pond uh, created off, off the beach. Um, What's that furry bird in the bottom middle? Yeah, so we also had a, a mink which they spend, uh, apparently they're fairly common in the jetty out there where we go um, looking for some seabirds and, and ducks. Um, and this guy was super friendly and I was chasing him along the jetty trying to get a good photograph. Um, so that was, a non-bird was my favorite part of that trip. I loved the, uh, the seeing the main so one that you could come to or you could come out Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Cool, yeah, we can. Uh, I'm gonna mute. David. <laughs> I don't think he was asking a question. Let's see. All right. So st we did Steve and uh, Diane Coggin and myself and Malia did a little side quest that we were just going to tell you about briefly. Uh, you want to talk about it a little, Steve? Yes, we went to the dump in Conway, South Carolina. <laughs> and the people that worked at the dump were just so friendly to us. They told us where we should drive and where we should park and where we can find the bird. And uh, the bird was, well, first we saw maybe 10,000 gulls. <laughs> yeah. uh, so imagine you're going there to try to find a rare gull, and this is what you see. So it's a little overwhelming at first. But we were very lucky. The gull that we were after was the slaty bat gull, and they're usually in Alaska and Eastern Asia. And it was just sitting on this hillside. We were there probably 20 minutes and this gull came in and flew down and sat there very close to us. So we got terrific looks at it. And this picture in the bottom left, uh, Christine drew a circle around the bird and an arrow pointing to the bird. And yes, that was the bird. That's, yeah, that was a phone, a phone picture. I texted to my friends that yes, I found it, believe it or not. Um, so um, those that are relatively new to birding, um, Landfills or dumps are usually really good, especially for gulls. <laughs> and um, fortunately, we were downwind, and there were a couple of cool other things. There were eagles there as well. So it was a, 
it was a little side trip, not far from Huntington uh, Beach State Park. So we were really glad that we went out of our, uh, slightly out of our way to see this rare bird that's not usually on this part of the country. And there was a celebratory drink later. There we go. Yeah, we had fun. All right. So now we have a few um, membership photos. Um, these are some backyard bird photos from uh, Betty Thomas. Thank you for sending those in, Betty. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, I you feel bad for, for that. Um, you, your bird there on the bottom left is having some technical difficulties. Yeah, I understand that's uh, avian keratin disorder or something, but I got a good picture of him with this big cross beak. Yeah. It's a very much a regular in the backyard. Good. You found some easy food, so hopefully you're keeping them okay. <laughs> so Orioles are a regular in your yard, and how long have they been around? Um, they came back, well, it was in December, I think, um, and I've seen as many as five at one time. Now they're more like, more coming like one or two at a time. But Wonderful. Yeah, it's kind of cold to see them. They're there pretty regularly during the day. That's great. You know? That's great. And I love the shot of the uh, golden crown kinglet. That's one of my favorite little regular birds. And there were, I really got a nice shot. The, thank you. There were um, five or six of them in the grass that didn't get mowed in Freedom Park. And they mm -hmm. were just busy getting cleaning the, the bugs from the grass. And they just didn't care whether I took the picture or not. Yeah. So it was, that was fun. I, I would imagine, uh, you know, certainly in South Charlotte, and I'm assuming probably the whole area, kinglets are really having a banner year this year, golden crowned and ruby crowned. I've, I've never seen the numbers so big. How about you, Steve, up your further north? Are you seeing a lot of kinglets? Yeah, we are. And like you said, golden crowns more than usual. This summer, yeah. This yeah. Very cool. All right. You want to take this Very one, good. Steve? Michael Board. Michael Board, you sent in this lovely picture of a female scarlet tanager, which is unusual for January. Michael, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, yeah, we just kind of stumbled upon it. Jennifer and I were walking in the preserve at Catawba, uh, where we go fairly regularly, and the oh. color just kind of stood out against all yeah. the muted backgrounds and the and the snow and. Of course, honestly, because of the time of year and being a female, neither one of us exactly knew what it was. And we kind of got some help and we're kind of between Western and Scarlet and it ended up being with the, I guess, the lack of strong wing bars that it's a, a Scarlet mm -hmm. female. So it was cool mm -hmm. to see. Yeah, very nice. Beautiful. Very, very pretty. And Gretchen, you got these lovely shots of redheads in Fort Mill. Um, it's nice to see the, the female, she doesn't get as much love. <laughs> the mail, but they're both beautiful. John, I don't think is on. Well, he's got this beautiful Cooper's hawk. I love this shot. It's, um, you know, the, the the way the photo was cropped and and just the the composition. Re you really get that lean impression of the, of the bird, which um, I thought was pretty cool and intense. Um, he had a palm warbler as well. That's the, the picture up towards the top and a pine underneath. I've been having, um, the pines have been very regular in my yard this year as well. Um, and they're always fun to see a bright pop of color in the winter time. Jeff Turner also sent in these photos. Um, on the top right is a fox sparrow. Hopefully some of you have been fortunate enough to see them this season. Um, they're not super, super regular, but if you're out there and looking, um, hopefully you'll run across them. They really are a, a pretty sparrow and they're only here for us in the winter time. Um, and on the bottom right is a tufted titmouse, pretty common, but I, this is just a super cute composition, a really, a really nice capture of that bird. Steve Jenkins. Unmute uh, yourself. You can Whoa. unmute yourself. This is sort of a, a summary of, of why you should Whoa. join our bird walks because look at this nice variety of birds. It's, this is one day um, in McAlpine Park on a bird walk. Steve captured um, all these different species. 
going to say anything, Steve? <laughs> Enjoy. Okay. <laughs> Good. So a swamp sparrow on the left, a um, a grebe. Hi, Bill Green. I build Grebe on the top. Of course, the infamous woody woodpecker, the pileated or pileated, depending on what you what you go with, woodpecker. On um, speaking of how we've been seeing so many kinglet, kinglets, there's a nice capture on the bottom right of a ruby crown where you actually can see a little flash. And I love their little yellow feet. I think this is a very cute capture of the bird in flight. Um, and a killdeer getting a worm. Yeah, we were we were actually greeted in the parking lot by the woodpeckers. A mm -hmm. pair, of them, pair of them. Very nice. All right, Steve, take it away. Steve and Judy, a little bit more about the some photos of their adventures um, in Minnesota. Some of you had heard them chatting about it earlier on at the start of the show. We had three different species of owls we saw down at the bottom middle. Those are four, count them, four long-eared owls all sitting in the same tree. Love it. It was just amazing. And on the top left, there's a great gray owl. And uh, just to the right of that is a snowy owl. We saw three different snowy owls. That one was in a very odd place. Uh, we're sort of in an industrial park inside a rail yard and we're driving over railroad tracks and going between big trucks and, and uh, warehouses. And that guy was sitting up on top of that pole, flew down, caught a bowl, ate the bowl, went back on top of the pole. The sun was already <laughs> down by the time we found this bird. So wow. getting pretty dim. A uh, black cat chickadee. We don't see that many of those mm -hmm. around thing about the black cap chickadees you know we here we see one or two maybe three chickadees at a time there and it's probably mainly because of the cold how cold it was but I looked up and there had to have been like 15 in a, in a bush all waiting to come into the feeders uh, you know that they have out but I mean it just it was a tree full of black caps I was amazed cool and what is that? Is that a sun dog? I never know exactly what people are talking about. With no, that. that's actually a sun, a sun bow. Sun bow. And the, this was taken about 1030 in the morning. Uh, the spots on uh, the left and the right and at the top would be considered the, um, the sun dog, if that's all we saw. Uh, uh -huh. But in this case, the whole thing I mean, it was it was a, a, like a rainbow, but it was sunbow, and of course, that's the sun in the center. Uh, somebody had said, "Oh, that's a wonderful sunrise," and it's not a sunrise. It actually was much later in the day, um, and it was it was that as spectacular as that picture is. <clears throat> it um, it it didn't do it justice, and that blue thing in the middle that's that's something from the from the iPhone. Yeah. Um, that wasn't there. <laughs> that's not. That's a, a no request. UFO. No, no, it's not a UFO. <laughs> I, I thought I sent you the one that had didn't have that in there. I took it out. Um, but it, it was it was huge. I mean, it just filled the whole sky. I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, as far as birds, the guy down on the right, that's a, a, a red pole. And that is now my favorite bird. Oh, uh, they're so cute. They are so cute and they have such an attitude. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really, they really kind of, kind of push, I don't want to say push their ways. I mean, they would, you know, they weren't afraid of anything, uh, which was amazing. And of course, over on the left um, is Lake Superior at, um, let's see, how, how cold it was at 15 below, but the wind was something like, 30, 25, 30 miles an hour. So it was amazing. This is what they call pancake ice. Uh, there was actually a little bit of uh, you know water. So this is kind of undulating here, um, which was very interesting. Cool. Very nice. All right. We wanted to remind you that coming up in uh, two weeks is the Great Backyard Bird Count, an annual event. Um, all you do is your regular e-birding, but they ask folks to make a point um, to get out. And it's, um, I think it's, is it Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Thursday, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday? 
Mm -hmm. Anyway, get out there and count. Be, I'm sure there'll be lots of walks, but um, you can just do your your backyard or your neighborhood pocket park, and uh, that would be appreciated. We always love to see what's going on with the winter bird census. All right, Steve, you want to take this? Yes, yeah, so our next meeting on March 3rd is going to be by Zoom, and Simon Thompson, who's the owner of Ventures Birding Tours, and we went with Ventures Birding Tours to Minnesota. He's going to talk about warblers, talking about migration, talking about identification, and some information about where to go in the mountains to find the birds. And that's a picture of Simon there in the bottom. He's the guy in the middle with the, the baseball cap on. So you'll see him next month. Where did you, where did you get that picture? The internet. <laughs> that, a little older he, now? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I think he's younger now. <laughs> he's got to be only in his. Yeah, that has <laughs> to be twenty like years first old. Him Thirty years ago. <laughs> well, he should be flattered then. Don't be surprised when you see him. Anyway, he looks good. a little well, heavier too. <laughs> it's good. I've heard so much about Simon, so I'm looking forward to hearing him speak. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, early March it'll just be it'll be the start warm up season. Everybody, get your get your next limber. It's that's, uh, it's almost time. So I'm looking forward to that. I always need a refresher before the next season starts. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. All right, uh, Richard, we are going to uh, have you talk a little bit about the upcoming bird walks. Okay, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. Sure do. Um, yeah, we really do. And especially for those of you that are or working and need to have weekends. Uh, Jeff Turner has three Sunday walks as well as we have quite a few Saturday walks. We have some in Mecklenburg County. We have some in Lincoln County and I think in Gaston County. Yeah. Um, just a wide variety of, of different things. Uh, Taylor's doing a Woodcock walk. It's full right now. Um, if you do sign up for any of these and we'll take up to 12 on most of these walks and it looks like you can't make it if you'll please let the leader know beforehand so we could put somebody in in your place. Yeah. So all this stuff you can find on mechbirds.org, all our listings and any updates if there's any changes. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got a lot lined up. So I encourage folks to uh, find something they're interested in. And whether you've been doing it a long time or you're a newbie, everybody's welcome. So we, we look forward to seeing folks out, out and about. <laughs> all right that's it for me we're going to go ahead and steve do you want to take it over for the rest of the show okay uh janet palmer will introduce our speaker for tonight so janet are you on i am on um it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight whose passion for the natural world has always inspired me Julie began seriously foraging for mushrooms and other fungal fruiting bodies in 2000 while working as an outreach park ranger at W. Kerscott Reservoir in Wilkesboro. Previous to that, during her eight seasons as a Blue Ridge Parkway interpretive ranger, her top passion was medicinal and edible wild and naturalized plants. Julie taught English and humanities classes at Wilkes Community College where she also served as chair of the arts and communications department and global education director. After retiring from Wilk, she returned to her work as a seasonal ranger, working a season in Juneau, Alaska, as an interpretive forest ranger in Tongass Natural, National Forest. And many of us enjoyed her pictures and posts from Alaska and from her month long meander back to North Carolina. Julia spent two seasons as a naturalist and environmental educator for Grandfather Mountain Stewardship Foundation. And last season, she returned to the parkway as interpretive ranger at Doton Park, the plan for this year as well. Currently, she's teaching two courses for ASU and an NC environmental education certification prep course for students of outdoor recreation management at Lees McRae College. 
Tonight, um, I've known Julie since her now adult daughter was six weeks old and she started teaching for us while she was finishing her master's degree. But tonight, um, she's going to share her knowledge with us in Fundamentals of the Kingdom Fungi. Um, our presenter, my friend, Julie Mullis. I think if you all go to... Yeah, do I need to... Okay, so now you share your share your screen. She's okay, got you. There we go. Good. And I'm going to click the slideshow. Yep. No, no, no. Over no. in the corner, up above design, the little icon oh, above. Got design. you. Okay. okay, got it. All right. So yeah. um, thank all of you for attending. Um, my program. I've got my email address at the bottom if you have questions afterwards. And once I get through the slides, um, I'll come back to me and answer any questions. I've got some books if anyone's interested in guidebooks and a few other winter fungi that if you want to see them not on the slide, I've got them. But anyway, just I'm um, going back to what Janet said about when I became an aficionado of fungi. It was in 2000 at Debbie Carr Scott when I was um, the only outreach ranger there in a rainy year when um, didn't have much to do, but lots and lots of mushrooms were popping up. So some maintenance workers saw me keying out a mushroom out of boredom and they were so excited about what I found that after that, every single morning when I came into work, there was a pile of mushrooms, um, you know, three, um, at least, um, at least, foot high anyway and so I felt compelled to begin keying them out and and as I did that and began to find some that were said to be very good edibles like the cauliflower fungi and old man of the woods and lots of bull eats and um um and so on I just became completely hooked so um that's become my passion matter of fact my daughter that Janet mentioned um she probably asked her first language was um mushroom identification and uh, scientific names but you can see from the other picture I have that you know sometimes I actually become a fun gal <laughs> or a fun guy whichever you want but anyway I want to talk just a little bit about exactly what this organism is. Um, it's an invisible network under the ground that is so important for soil health. Um, um, the organism itself um, is uh, only one cell thick, but it can be miles and miles long. Um, and that's what you call mycelium um, made of um, hyphae that um, ends up um, eating from the outside in. Matter of fact, it's um, what we would call stomach acid or it's called metabolite is on the outside of itself. So it, it grows towards its food and digests it by bringing it into itself. And of course that nutrition allows it to grow even more in all directions. And when it decides it wants to sexually reproduce, it sends forth um, these fruiting bodies, which we call mushrooms even though actually a mushroom is only one of these fruiting bodies that contains gills underneath, which look like umbrella spokes. And it's them that are able to release the spores in hopes of meeting another spore that's compatible to itself. And you know that's how they end up sexually reproducing. And of course, we only see these fruiting bodies. We don't see what's underneath the soil that is the real organism. And so um, you know, when we go looking for mushrooms, we're just finding what's like the apple on an apple tree, not seeing the tree itself. Looking um, as far as um, fungi and their relationship to other organisms, they actually are more closely related to animals than they are plants. As a matter of fact, we have a common ancestor with fungi um, that um, was about on the planet 1.1 billion years ago. And if you wanna put that in perspective, life has been on earth only about 3.7 million 
billion years ago. And as far as um, organisms coming out of the sea and onto the land, um, fungi came onto land 13, about 1300 million years ago, whereas plants came out only about 700 million years ago and animals between 440 and 470 million years ago. So yeah, they've been on land on earth much longer than we have yet. Um, um, yeah, yet we still have similarities, but you may say, well, they seem more like a plant than an animal, but when you remember what I said about them ingesting food, whereas plants make their own food through photosynthesis, you know, we both have that same strategy of having to take food from the outside and bringing it into ourselves. Now we bring it in and it's digested with stomach acid inside, whereas they have their metabolite or stomach acid on the outside in order to to get their nutrition so i always find that really interesting that we are more closely related to them than they are to plants but um, when you look at certain diseases um, they've been fighting them longer than we have even though we have many of the same type of pathogens so i'll talk a little bit toward the end about um, mycologists like trad cotter who have been actually seeing that if you put um, a my, mycelia from a certain fungi, like let's say oyster mycelium in with a scraping from your throat when you have strep, the mycelium will actually grow towards the pathogen and then end up um, surrounding it with its metabolite and neutralizing it. In other words, fighting its own pathogen um, by surrounding it. And if you ended up um, putting some of that metabolite um, into your own body, you could actually fight your own strain of strep without medication. It, yeah, it's really interesting just what we could actually do if we actually employed fungi into our world of healing and many other things. So uh, it just, um, the more you learn about it, the more you get fascinated in every single aspect. But anyway, this is a closer up look of what mycelium actually looks like. And a lot of people um, don't understand that um, the, the mushrooms we see or the fruiting bodies are actually really tightly condensed mycelium that forms these bodies that we do see in all sorts of different forms. So that just gives you more of a look and you can see mycelium, mycelial masses or hyphal masses yourself if you like look in a pile of mulch and you know, a lot of times they end up really condensing so that even though they're one cell thick, you end up really seeing them and that's when they find good food and they'll actually grow towards a food source. And even though um, you know, they're one big organism, they still can communicate with each other um, and they think that through like electrical currents that um, you know, one part of itself that could even be a half a mile in another direction can find food, but it communicates with the whole organism. And then the whole organism begins to grow in the direction of that food. So there's so much that we need to learn about uh, with them, but we're beginning to find out that they work a whole lot like our computer systems, almost like they are a big computer that can communicate with itself, even though each hyphal N can work as an individual, but really fascinating. So um, as far as knowing the size of a fungus, um, a lot of times you can tell the size of one particular organism when you see it put out fruiting bodies in a fairy ring. And this is an example of a fairy ring. Um, what you're looking at um, is the outside of the organism putting up fruiting bodies because it's the youngest part of the organism, which is most likely to have the excess um, um, mycelium to create the fungal bodies. So when you see a see a fairy ring, that's really what's going on. It's just sending up um, you know, sex organs basically in order to reproduce um, um, on the outside of itself. The largest organism on the planet that we've discovered so far, and there could be more even larger ones, is actually a giant Amarillia um, 
fungus or mushroom in Oregon that they have de um, determined by um, doing DNA tests of different fruiting bodies over a large area that it is at least 2,200 acres wide, which is a little over three, almost three and a half square miles long, I mean wide, and they know it's all one single organism. And not only is it the largest recorded organism on the planet, but it's also, you know, one of the oldest too at 2,400 years old plus. So, um, you know, it takes up a lot of the Malheur National Forest out in Oregon. Now, as far as by, by weight, the largest organism they have found is an aspen tree. And if you know, aspens grow as clones of each other. So you have one that keeps putting out shoots and it is also acres large, but, um, um, but it's all one organism. So, you know, we're really redefining what we see as an individual organism now that we're doing DNA testing to tell what is a one organism. So um, my college has theorized that there are probably between this is very conservatively speaking, the more I read, 1.5 and 5.1 million species of fungi, even though I was recently reading that somebody actually is pushing it more towards, you know, uh, over 120 million species. And we don't really know how many there are, because if you think, we don't really know the organism is there unless it sends up a fruiting body. And these fruiting bodies or mushrooms only last for maybe a week, just long enough to get its spores out, and then it ends up going away. So if there's not a mycology where every single mushroom pops up, you know they can come and go without us ever knowing that they were there. Um, but of these millions of species, there's only about 75,000 that have scientific names, and um, only about um, probably 100 to 200,000 produce mushrooms. So there's other reproductive strategies other than these fruiting bodies, which account for a whole lot of other fungi. So um, that just kind of puts into perspective how many species there could be out there. I mean, they're really, um, they're really everywhere and in every organism, including us and within plants. Matter of fact, no plant is out there without some sort of fungus growing within it, helping it get its nutrients. So it's um, interesting. Now, as far as um, which ones are edible and which ones aren't, sorry, if y'all hear anything, we've got a rumba. Does it unplug? Um, Sorry, I'm at my daughter's house who has good internet connection. So I'm here, but they have a rumba. But anyway, um, you probably everyone's just wondering about poisonous mushrooms and edible mushrooms after we've seen how many there are out there. Well, we know of about a um, hundred species that are decent edibles. Um, probably 40 that are really sought out. That doesn't mean that there are not other ones out there that haven't been discovered that are good edibles, but of the ones that people actually go out and forage for, I would say, you know, um, 40 of them are, are around here in Eastern North America that we look for every time we go out, if we're a forager. And as far as poisonous mushrooms, ones that will kill you, you know, I would say there's probably between nine and 20 that will kill you. Um, and I used to always say only about nine, but there's a lot of them in the Ammonita uh, complex that as we've done DNA testing, um, actually are different species than where they were clumped before, but they're still like within one complex. So there's a lot of them just in the Ammonita complex that have the deadly amatoxins in them. Um, but you know, a lot of times um, they're just counted as one species called destroying angel or death cap, even though when you really look at the DNA, there are more species than just that. So you wonder like um, if you're thinking about foraging for mushrooms, you know, I never say just go out and do it. You've got to do your research first. And the easiest way to do it is to learn the ones that will kill you and know to stay away from them and their lookalikes. And then you start with one edible 
that is unmistakable. And there's probably a list of 10 that are really hard to mix up with anything else. And I'll be touching on some of those today. But again, I don't want this to be your only lesson in edible mushrooms. And as soon as mushrooms pop up, you go out and start eating them because you've heard this presentation. I want this just to be a seed that's planted that will allow you to begin doing your own research and have your own guidebooks in order to uh, then explore um, one very easy edible that's found in your area. And then once you know that, as well as you know a good friend, then you can begin adding another one. So um, before we get into that, I wanted to bring up one other thing that I find is very different about fungi than about animals. And that is that the way they express their sexes, whereas we typically have two, maybe three, um, uh, you know, three sexes, you know, male, female, and transgender, you know, and you can argue even about three and not just two. If you look at fungus, um, they have hundreds of different sexes per se, so, but they can be compatible with each other. It's more of just an, um, a negative versus a positive um, um, uh, expression and the negatives are attracted to the positives and vice versa, no matter in which actual sex they are. And one of my favorite all-time mushrooms, which I actually see I spelt wrong, that should be S-H-I, I-T-A-K-E, um, there's been 22,000 uh, sexual expressions found of that species. So it does really add a lot of complications to just how they reproduce. Um, but there's been a lot of change, just like with birds, just like with reptiles and amphibians, and just like with plants, now that we are doing DNA testing to actually see who is related to whom. and um, yeah, and so um, the world of fungus has really been turned up on its head, just like with um, with botany. You know, like the one uh, botanical um, example that really bothers me um, <laughs> because I love asters for being asters. But you know, now that we've done DNA testing, we have found that um, the North American asters are in no way related to the European asters. And since the European asters were given their name first, they're officially the asters. But now we have about nine genera that are um, what we used to call asters that have totally different names now. Well, the same thing is happening with fungus too, because we always used to clump things by how they looked. But once we end up doing DNA testing, we start finding that there's a, so many that we thought were very closely related to each other or even in one species or genus that really are not kin at all. So lots and lots of the, of the mycological names are changing and that makes it more difficult to actually name a species. So even in this um, PowerPoint, when I put a, a mycological name or a scientific name, uh, it very well may have shifted since I've made that slide as more and more people begin doing DNA testing on different um, fungi to find that they really aren't what we always thought they were. And um, that leads to some complications. And many times two different mycologists or three different mycologists do the same thing at the same time and come up with different conclusions. So it's really a growing and a changing science right now, just like with so many other fields. But as far as um, primary roles that, um, that the fungus has with, um, with plants, when they have a very close relationship with, the two main ones that we think about are as decomposers, which is breaking down the uh, plants that have died or dying in order to bring them back into the life cycle. And I'll say it's not just with plants, but it's just as much with animals and other organisms too. And the same thing with mycorrhizal relationships where um, the, the primary um, connection between the, um, the fungi and the, the plant is um, doing some exchange um, is a form of symbiosis, which comes really close to mutualism, I feel, where you have um, on the roots of, of plants, you have the mycelium actually extending the roots 
that's by um, growing onto the roots or inside the roots. And you have two different strategies, one that actually becomes a part of the root and others that are on the outside extending it, but allowing the plants to get more nutrients from the soil, more water, and in exchange for sugars that are made through photosynthesis. So the fungi gets um, food from the plants that the plants make in exchange for helping the plants grow. They also can connect um, many plants, you know, some of the same species and some of different species that um, are friends per se, so that they can actually move nutrients from a stronger one to a weaker one. There's a movie out uh, called uh, Fantastic Fungi that goes into this with amazing pictures, which I highly recommend. So you've got those two relationships and you'll see that I have pink lady slippers, a uh, type of orchid that uh, are native to, uh, to North Carolina, especially the mountains. They actually would not be able to live without their relationship with a fungal fungus on their roots. And to be honest, they actually um, have to have them um, until they get to a certain age, or would they they would never would exist at all. And um, according to the book Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which I really highly recommend reading, that no orchid on the planet could even exist without fungus. But you may see uh, pink lady slippers and other wild orchids at farmer's markets for sale. You should never buy them unless they have been raised in a nursery because once they're taken out of their native habitat where the fungus in the soil is what is supporting and sustaining them. And if you plant them in your yard where that's not there, they're not going to live and you're killing a beautiful but not very frequent organism just by doing that. So um, parasitism um, is like the form of, uh, of symbiism that uh, you, we always look down on the most, but there's a lot of that that goes on in the fungal world um, where you have an you know, have an organism that's taking from another organism without, um, um, without giving back. And um, the one that probably is most despised by, by arborists and, um, you know, and forest managers is the honey mushroom or the armorilia, which is the one that I pointed out earlier as being the largest organism on the planet. Now the fruiting bodies themselves are quite delicious. To me, they are the, the native, uh, mushroom that tastes most like shiitake, which is an Asian species to me, but um, they um, will um, take, they will actually um, kill uh, oak trees and other hardwoods very quickly. They actually, once they end up landing on the tree, they end up creating these masses of mycelia called um, um, a mica, um, a rhizomorphs, and you can see some of the black strands that's coming out of that oak tree that then just grows into the tree and can kill it within a few years. So it's one of these good bad deals where the fruiting bodies that become very prevalent when they're in a hardwood forest are delicious for us to eat, but it's really not good at all for the hardwood trees that can die pretty quickly from it. Um, and then you have a fungi that actually grows on other fungi, fruiting bodies, um, which are called hypomyces, means own mushrooms, um, if you break that down. And the, the one that's most sought after is one called the lobster mushroom. Um, so um, it grows on um, two different a genera of, of fungus that is very prevalent here, the Rusula and the Lactarius. And when it invades these fruiting bodies, it actually turns it a different color, the color of a cooked lobster, which is how it gets it. One of the reasons it gets its name, but it also improves the flavor. So sometimes you'll have a Lactarius or a Rusula that um, is very hot. Or, or, or bitter, acrid, but um, when the mycelium 
um, of the this hypomyces takes over, it actually changes the flavor and makes it good and makes it kind of seafood like, like a lobster, which is another reason it gets its name. So this is one that's quite sought out. And fortunately, the two uh, genera that it um, becomes a parasite of is um, are two genera where you don't have any within it that will kill you. Now, there's some that will upset your stomach, you know, when they're really hot, like I mentioned, or really bitter, but um, none of them will kill you. So, you know, if you find the lobster mushroom, you know, you can know that, you know, it's not going to be one that's going to, to hurt you to eat it, no matter which species of it has been invaded. Now, the, this is the fungus that is probably the most insidious <laughs> um, of all because it will parasitize insects. This is the cordyceps, also known as the zombie fungi, that um, will when, that when its spores land on an insect and eat, and their species that are very host specific to certain insects, um, it ends up taking over their bodies. But um, and growing into their organs and everything. Now, I used to think that it grew into their minds and caused mind control because it was taking over its brain. But actually, after reading Entangled Life, I found that actually the brain is the one thing that many times is not taken over, but still the behaviors of these animals, these insects will change for some species to the point where they will do things that's very different from their their normal life, like climb up a high tree and then clamp down as hard as they can with their jaws on the underside of a leaf, right at the point when the fungus um, is ready to, um, to grow out of its head. And at that point, it releases its spores just at the right place, high up in the air, so that then it can drop down on the other suspecting insects. And this picture that you see on the left is um, one that I found uh, of a beetle that has been parasitized. And you can see the cordyceps militaris growing out of its head. Um, and you can see a few other examples, one on a cricket or a grasshopper, and you'll find plenty of them on ants as well. Um, and the, even though that one up there looks like a tarantula, but um, I find lots of them on ants all together in one area. I'll be walking in the woods and I'll see what looks like a whole lot of coral fungus just sticking up out of the ground, but they seem to have a little bit more of a it looks like little glands growing on them and I'll start digging down into the ground and I'll find hundreds of ants all with these cordyceps growing out of their heads. And what has happened there is as the ants are going back to the nest, there are guard ants. And you may have seen this if you just ever lay on your belly and watch ants. But the ants will look like they're talking to each other, some going one way and some going the other. And what is happening often is the guard ants are checking the ones going back to the nest to make sure there are no cordyceps spores on these ants. And if they're there, they kill them right then and there and bury them. And then they themselves commit suicide rather than bringing the spores back to the nest after they've been exposed to the infected ants. And then um, out of the ground will grow these fun th this fungus from the ant's head. And since the guard ants have killed hundreds of them, you'll see hundreds of them all in one area. But um, it's been very interesting just how people have been thinking about using these as a type of pesticide that ends up um, being very specific to one insect without hurting any other kinds of insects. But here's some more pictures of ones I've found. So I'm going to get out of parasites and move on into just some really nice edible decomposers. And I'll start with my favorite mushroom or fungus. I can't call it a mushroom because actually mushrooms, as I say, are those who have gills underneath them. But this one's a polypore, which if you look at the underside, it looks like there are little um, spongy dots underneath. And if you were to break the fungus open, you would see they're like little tubes going up into the body of the mushroom. And lots of different fungi have pores on their underside, but this one is called chicken of the woods or sulfur shelf or latiporus sulfurious, um, and it tastes 
just like chicken as far as the texture goes. And I think the flavor is even better. It grows on wood, on wood that is dying, usually logs that are already down, but I have seen trees on their way out that have these growing all over it. And um, I, you know, love to cook it in about any way that you would cook chicken. I grill it, you know, I um, saute it, um, you know, I, um, you know, put it in burritos, uh, barbecue it, you know, so many different ways. And you'll see from how much I love it that I have lots of pictures because not only is it an absolutely beautiful fungus that looks like a sunrise on top and on the bottom, I mean, when it's very young or when you look on the underside, it looks like yellow, like a baby chick. There's my daughter, Hattie, when we were hiking the Appalachian Trail and found some. And that was one of the happiest moments of our trip. Every time we found new um, chicken of the woods. Another one that's a decomposer that's also quite sought after is called Hen of the Woods or Griffola frondosa. And, and it um, looks like the, the tail of a hen, which is how it gets its name. I don't think it's as chickeny tasting and it's much thinner than the chicken of the woods, but it still has a really nice flavor. And what's really good about it is sometimes you'll find huge ones growing off a dying log and you know have enough food for a complete feast. But um, it's also nice tasting too. And you can see the picture of this. And you know, if you shred it up some, it will taste more like a shredded chicken than the whole pieces of chicken, like chicken of the woods. Another one that is a decomposer are the oysters. And you know, there's many species of oysters out there, both wild and domestic. I have a picture of a, some domestic ones growing on the right um, that um, you can find in Asian supermarkets. You, know, you can find you know, eight or nine different species of those there, you know, from golden ones to you know, the orange phoenix ones to the gray ones to blue ones. Uh, and you know, they're also very easy to grow in your own yard. You can buy the spawn um, at any of the mushrooms Mushroom suppliers like Mushroom Mountain or um, Everything Mushroom or Fill and Forest products, and you drill the holes in your logs, put the spawn inside, put wax over it, and then just stick it under some rhododendron. Yeah, I, I lay them around trees like a teepee, while some people stack them up like like log cabins, and you just let them go for nine months until the conditions are right and the mycelium has colonized the logs, and then boom, you start getting mushrooms whenever the conditions are right. I do that a lot with shiitakes as well as oysters, but you can find oysters in the wild as well, quite well. And they do have a texture of seafood, you know, not may, maybe maybe oysters actually, but I um yeah, but definitely some type of seafood. Um, now one that. Um, tastes like steak now that we're and I find it so interesting that you know all these edible mushrooms seem to be um, compared to the meats that we know but a uh, beef steak is the name, this the name of this one and it does um, taste and look so much like steak when you slice it like I did when I found it this summer and that's the picture you're seeing with a big slap of butter and even though I know butter is not good for you, I make the exception when it's a wild mushroom, but you can see the texture of it does look so much like the, the texture of a steak. And if you marinate it, like you can see up above, you know, it can taste very much like a marinated steak, but even when you don't marinate it, it has a slightly sour flavor that tastes almost like a skirt steak or, you know, something that's been marinated for a while without even doing anything. But even just growing, you can see what a beautiful fungus it is. Then you have lion's mane, which definitely has a seafood texture, more like crab meat. And there's a lot of these uh, heresium mushroom or fungi um, that um, are in the uh, are, that have the 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 growth strategy of having teeth um, rather than gills underneath or spine, I mean, or, um, get, or pores, but instead they have modified spines, which are also called teeth, that are the long hanging down parts of themselves. Those are kind of like, if you can imagine um, gills on a mushroom, but really just growing wild and the whole fungus or whole mushroom being gills, but that's what it is with spines instead. And um, so they grow 
uh, off of trees, usually dying trees, and they're just really beautiful mushrooms to see, but really fabulous to eat. So you've got some called lion's mane, which are probably best known even just pharmaceutically because they're supposed to make your mind much sharper when you eat them or take their extract. But you also have one called bear's head, which you see in the top left corner. And um, there's several others too, but they're really pretty mushrooms or fungi. I have to get used to not calling them all mushrooms too. Now these are also hedgehogs uh, or, or teeth mushrooms, tooth mushrooms. Um, and you can see underneath, rather than having those umbrella spoke-like gills or pores that look like a sponge, it actually looks like there are teeth or spines underneath, and that's their reproductive strategy. All of their spores grow on these spines rather than you know, on these book, book page-like gills or on these um, tubes that create pores. Now the hedgehogs, there are some really good edibles like the sweet tooth that um, are really firm when you cook them. Matter of fact, I find I have to bake them many times because they're much tougher than most mushrooms, but the flavor can be really good. This is one that's not an edible, but it's so unusual. Um, the bloody hydnellum is one name, but on the other side, it's also called strawberries and cream. Um, but um, either way, if you were to taste it, it is extremely, extremely bitter. But if you were to look underneath, it has spines rather than gills. I had never found it around North Carolina, but it, I found quite a few of them up in Juneau, Alaska. And when I was up in Massachusetts uh, on the Cape this September, I ran into a lot of them. But I've been told by a good friend of mine that who uh, belongs to a lot of like mushroom Facebook pages that people have been finding them a, a bit in North Carolina lately. I just haven't. But you can see it's exuding a latex that looks just like blood or strawberry cream, which is really interesting for one of the tooth fungus. Now, um, this is an early spring one. And since we're approaching, eventually approaching spring, this is one of the very few fungi that you can actually find in the spring that's really good. And it's uh, called Dryad Saddle. Um, and it is a decomposer as well. And when it's young, it actually has a very pleasant flavor, but as it gets older, it gets tougher to the point where you feel like you're eating some sort of jerky or something if you eat it when it's too old. And then you have chaga, which is a growth. Uh, it looks like a big growth on birch trees. Uh, in the northern, um, um, in the far north states and countries, this one is very highly sought out to make a tea from, especially in Siberia and the northern Russian areas, um, because it's known to be such a powerful antioxidant um, and, uh, and detoxifier that people drink it all the time. And when I, I when I visited my friend in Anchorage, um, we would go into like Asian food stores, and behind the stores there would be people um, that was were drying it because they would be gathered and then brought there and then they would end up drying it out and then um, selling it and to make a tea from it you would end up um, boiling it in water to soften it and then you can grind it up and use it as a powder to go in the teas or you can put it into a tincture but it actually has a really a really um, I think a very pleasing flavor reminds me a lot of iced tea and when I was in Juneau my favorite coffee shop overlooking the channel um, had a chaga latte, which I got all the time. And it was just really delicious. And I knew it was very healthy for me as well. Um, now, speaking of medicinals, um, these are the three most powerful medicinals. And two of these three are native uh, with a turkey tail and the reishi, which are in the middle. And then you have the shiitake, which uh, even though it's Asian, uh, is grown um, very easily you know, by just inoculating logs that you scavenge. And, and um, you, you, know, you need hardwood logs for them. And um, usually ones that have been cut down, um, uh, cut down um, 
about six weeks before you actually inoculate them. And you do that because you want the, um, the protectants that the wood has against fungus to go away so it doesn't end up um, rejecting the mycelium that you're putting in it. But you don't want it to be so old that it's colonized by other fungus. And you also want there to be plenty of sugars left because that becomes the food for these mushrooms. But all three of these are considered anti-cancer as well as um, um, you're building up your immune system. And they've just found so many different um, um, health benefits to these. What I do is I make a tincture out of all three of them, a, a two-phase process where I first, um, sometimes I first boil it and then I put it into alcohol and you know each each stage actually releases more of the chemicals. And I've read other people do it exactly the opposite way and then put it back into the alcohol. But either way, um, you know, it, it's something to look into if you're interested in medicinal mushrooms. Now, this is the reishi. Also, um, here, um, the species that you see the most is Ganoderma um, tasuga, which is the one that grows on the hemlock trees. And of course, we are losing hemlock trees with the hemlock woolly adelgid, and we have been for the last 25 years. Um, and even though that's terrible for the hemlock trees, some that are really old that grow up here in the mountains, um, the, um, the, this particular fungus really benefits. And there are other species other than the tasuga. Um, there's a golden one that I found this summer and a, a sessile one that I found at the Valley Crucis Park in Valley Crucis, but all of them have those medicinal values and they're just a really pretty mushroom. This was one that I found um, in Washington state um, I did a mushroom festival in Olympic National Park, and you can see that there were many of them up above this one, and all of the spores from the ones above it has fallen onto that one, and that's why it looks so powdery. All of those are the spores. Here's the turkey tails again, and there's a lot of lookalikes to turkey tails. Um, um, and um, they may or may not have medicinal values too, because most polypores do. But the, the way to distinguish a turkey tail is that when you look at it, at the underside of it, it's going to be white and you're gonna barely be able to see the pores on it. And they're just slightly elliptical. And um, the, you can't just look at the top side of it and see there's a lot of different colors because they can be lots of different color configurations. If you, if you snap it open, there's a little black line going through the center of the flesh, which shows you that that's a Trimetes versicolor. And of course, versicolor means multicolored, which you can tell, but that is one of the powerful medicinals that you'll find all over the place. There's my shiitake logs with some shiitakes flushing. And this is my, the perfect stage for eating them. I love them when they're just this size. And there's some more a little bit older. Now, this was the one that I found at Debbie Kerr Scott right when I got the, the mushroom bug. This is the cauliflower or Sparasis crispa. And it has the texture of egg noodles, slippery on your, your tongue and just so pleasant to eat. And it has a nutty flavor and it's a decomposer, but it tends to decompose dying roots around trees rather than growing off of the wood itself. And this is one that's not, I mean, it's not inedible, but it's really tough, but it's so big that people are really attracted to it. And I get so many people emailing me, asking me, um, what is this mushroom? Showing me pictures of it, but it's called the Berkeley's polypore or Bondozoia berkeleyi. Um, and this is another one, and I'm going to talk about this one later on as far as its toxicity, but just as far as being a decomposer um, is really beautiful. It's the jack-o'-lantern, and um, it um, actually isn't called a jack-o'-lantern because it's orange, but because it will glow at night. And it has to be right at a certain stage. I mean, I have picked many of them and brought them into my windowless bathroom and they never glow. But one night uh, when my daughter and her boyfriend and I were uh, 
hiking part of the Appalachian Trail, we decided to cowboy camp one night. And we had seen these all day. So I, I slept beside a patch of them. And when it got really dark, they started glowing. And the glow was so incredibly bright that not only could I see every single gill underneath, but I could also see the leaf litter, actual pine needles and stuff. And I actually had trouble going to sleep because I just couldn't stop staring at them, but they're really beautiful. Now, um, these are also decomposers, but a lot of times you don't think of them that way because they're such a teeny tiny little um, mushroom. This is the Mar Marasmius um, family of mushrooms um, that are also called the pinwheels. And these are the ones that, you know, you do best if you just lay down on your belly and just see what's growing around you in the leaf litter. And you find that these are growing off of pine needles and sometimes pine cones and, and sticks, but they're so incredibly beautiful. Too small to think of as being inedible though. And these, this one actually is a tropical species of it, but I just couldn't help but put it in there because it's just so pretty. And there's another group of really small ones, the mycenas, and um, you know, they also are really pretty, but instead of having stems that look more like sticks or pine needles themselves, you know, they're a little bit fleshier, but still really beautiful if you're really looking at what's small and they too are decomposers. Now these decomposers um, are known as bird's nests or cup fungi, and um, their reproductive strategy is not gills or pores, but they form these little um, sacks full of, of spores um, that when the rain hits them, it causes them to burst open and splash out of these cups. And these are sometimes called splash cups as a result, but I just think they're really neat because they look so much like little bird nest with birds eggs in them, which I figured would be good for you folks in the Audubon Society. Um, then you get into something that's partly fungus, but it's really a community. And those are the lichens. And they actually are a combination of different organisms, sometimes in three different kingdoms. You've got the fungus and the fungi kingdom that's actually holding them onto their substrate, whether it be a rock or wood or the ground itself. And But then you end up having um, either cyanobacteria or blue-green algae that's living as one with this fungi in order to produce the sugars that it feeds it in exchange for real estate, because it normally would not be able to grow outside of water, but um, with it um, combining with a fungus, all of a sudden it can have real estate on the side of a tree where other things aren't growing or on a rock. And the acid produced by these this, the, this lichen these organisms that are liking each other, they're actually breaking down the, the stone into soil, which is all of a sudden makes soil for all of the plants that can grow on the side of cliffs, many of our most endangered plants. But this one type of lichen is called crustose. You also have ones called fruticose and folios. And the folios that I'm showing you over here, the liberia um, um, pulmonaria, um, is actually one that's used as an indicator of the health of the air because it can only grow in the cleanest air. If there's any pollution at all, it can't grow. And I know I saw a lot of that when I worked up on grandfather and it made me feel pretty good about the air there. Now, rock tripe is actually a whole different um, growth scheme, an umbilicate, because it connects to its substrate with what looks like an umbilical cord. And rock tripe, you'll see growing all over rocks. Now, I want to mention something that's totally not a fungus, but is sometimes con um, considered a fungus, and that is a slime mold, the primordial slime mold and other slime molds. They may possibly be in a kingdom of their own, but they are not a fungus, um, but they are very interesting in how they work together at, as colonies, but have intelligence with each other to find their way to food and finding the shortest route possible. Um, there's been experiments done with um, 
mazes that are made to look like the streets of Tokyo, where they put the slime mold in one end and food on the other, and they'll find the shortest way there. And they have actually been using um, the slime molds, finding the shortest routes to actually make new routes of the subway system. Now, I have found that there's something very similar um, as far as this type of intelligence with fungal mycelium too. So, but um, both of it's been very much overlooked until recently. Now, this is a plant that is considered a fungus too. I'm just gonna hit on a few things that are not a fungus. This is uh, known as uh, Monotropa uniflora or the ghost pipe. It used to be called Indian pipe, but ghost pipe is probably used the most right now. And this one um, is a plant in the, the Heath family, which it has rhododendrons and blueberries, mountain laurels and such. But I do want to bring it up in relation to fungus because it is a parasite on the mycelium of fungus that's in the soil that is mycorrhizal to certain trees. And so this plant could not live without the fungus that it's getting its nutrients from that is exchanging its nutrients for the um, sugars in the trees that it has a symbiotic relationship with. So you've got a parasite living on a mutualistic fungus that is mutualistic to a tree that's making the, the um, sugars that this plant is using as well as the fungus that it's taking the sugars from. So very complex. All right, now, as far as beauty in the mushroom goes, I don't think there are more beautiful plants than the hygrophorus or the waxy caps. Not edible, I'm not poisonous, but because they're so full of water that if you were to try to cook them, they would dissolve into nothingness. But I just have to show them because they're so incredibly beautiful. And then you have another one that's really nice for its looks, the um, coral and cub fungi, both that look like they're growing under the ground. Now, these are some of the, the clubs that, that actually, you know, you see them sometimes and they could be one of those cordyceps, but, um, you know, there's many kinds of clubs that are not and corals as well. And some are edible and some are not, but it, uh, people in North America tend to not eat them nearly as much as they do, or actually in America, as in Mexico and, and um, other Latino countries, but some are edible and but most are just looked at because they're so beautiful and then Julie, you have yes we have i see we have several questions from okay um, members in and we typically wrap up before 8 30 so i wonder if you would mind having some time to answer a few questions sure i can do that i can stop anywhere <laughs> well i i am fascinated by this and these are great but Anyway, I know our members would like to ask a few questions. Sure, so. I'll be very glad to answer. Thank you. Okay, I've got a few in the chat. So we'll go with those first and then folks can uh, come on after they can unmute themselves and, and ask questions after that. Um, okay. Is it, is there any possibility, any possible role for the fund? As have you heard anything about the, the fungi helping with the coronavirus. That was the first one. <laughs> ah, I have not, even though that doesn't mean that that's not a possibility. And somebody else, um, SM was asking um, uh, about when you were talking about uh, the sexes and it said, a you mentioned plus and minus and what did that mean? Um, right, you know, they're just kind of divided into two different, um, um, uh, two different main categories of them and they have to meet up with the other kind in order to be sexually compatible but within the plus and within the minus there are hundreds of different sexual expressions. What do you mean by se sexual expression then? Um, and, and I don't know as much about this as I would like to but um, it, it's just like, you know, when you put two different organisms together, they either mate or they don't, and they have babies or they don't. And anything that's plus can match up with a, a negative and reproduce. But, um, but when you actually look at them DNA wise, there's a lot of different expressions when, within each side that produces something slightly different when the two mate together. 
So would those be considered mutations or, or just? No, I don't, I, I'm not sure on that. And, and that's a good question. Okay, yeah. we'll have to follow that up sometime. Um, and then SB has, if mushrooms are above the ground, spreading spores, and you want more mushrooms to appear, should you just leave them be? Yes, I would say so. I know there, especially if it's mycorrhizal, um, it's really hard to end up growing what you want, like morels that we're looking at right now. Sometimes you'll find um, that people sell spores for them, but they're never guaranteed to work. And it takes so long because they have to have the right type of tree that they're symbiotic with in order to be able to thrive themselves. Okay, so they can do, and then somebody else was saying, that they, um, we'll come back to SM in a second. Um, I've he heard that some mycologists will collect mushrooms in mesh bags to spread their spores as they walk through the woods. Right. Does this I actually do. help spread this, uh, the spores or does this just make us feel good? Um, I have always hoped that they spread the spores um, because, you know, you know, their gills are exposed and as you're walking you know there's that chance that they can fall out so you know I don't know if anyone's ever done any scientific research following people who are doing this with their mesh bags to see it, you know if there's more trails of mushrooms behind them but I think that would be interesting research but I do know that um, it is very bad to keep mushrooms in plastic that I always like to keep them in mesh bags or wax bags even when I'm storing them in the refrigerator because they don't do well without having oxygen, just like we wouldn't. Hmm. That's and I get, and when I, uh, I have bought mushrooms at Asian stores that were wrapped in plastic. And when I brought them home, they have this most horrible smell to them. Um, hmm. So I don't buy those. Okay. Um, yeah. And it seems like all of all the mushrooms that all the stores now after since COVID, everything seems to I be know. packaged. It's really yeah, I haven't bad. bought I'm, I don't think I bought any mushrooms since then because of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here's a, a, mess, a question from SM. <laughs> he she says, are they fattening? <laughs> No, but they do have a lot of nutrients in them. I'm going to just zoom through here because I've got a list on down of their nutritional value. Oh, there we go. So this is um, what is in a mushroom that's good for you. Lots and lots of trace minerals, especially some that you can't get from animal products at all. You know, it's good for vegetarians, especially the bees. Okay, does the uh, my mycelium keep producing fruit? So, does it does it want to uh, reproduce more than once? So, yeah. Okay. It does as it grows outward, um, it will keep producing fruit and it will die toward the center of itself and almost form more like a donut in time. But the in most cases, the, the, the fruiting bodies come from the outside and the youngest mycelium. Good. Um, then we have, uh, do you ever do foraging workshops? No, not often. Um, I find that doing this PowerPoint or, or some sort of PowerPoint actually lets people see a whole lot more. And sometimes I'll go, we'll go out after, you know, we do a program just to see what we find because people just like to have an Easter egg hunt and see what they find. But especially when you have a lot of people and just trying to gather around one, it's very hard to see that one item. And not only that, but um, you just never know exactly what you find. Um, yeah, you know, when I'm a park ranger, sometimes I'll lead a walk, and as we find mushrooms along the way, we definitely talk about them, but I rarely lead a walk that's just looking for mushrooms. Now, I do do a program with Wilkes Community College that's like an, an eight-hour day of foraging in general, and but it's plants and mushrooms and not just mushrooms, so we just end up talking about whatever we find. 
Okay. Um, they'll have to look at that. That was from BT, but uh, BY, oh, from Bud. Um, I think this is Tim. And he says, um, whoops, where'd he go? Tim, you just disappeared. Um, truffles are fruiting bodies that are underground. Yes. Uh, do they spread by spores or um, how, do, how do they work? Yeah, they spread by spores just as well, but they are an, actually an advanced form of fungus, fungal fruiting body, um, and that lots of different um, species are going or are, are families are going towards truffling because it's a much more advanced form of reproduction, kind of like flowers are much more effective than pine cones. And the reason that flowers are so much more effective is they put out things like bright colors and nice smells to attract a specific vector to them that does their pollinating much more better than just relying on the wind and water. If you think about most above ground mushrooms and other fungus, you know, they just drop their spores and hope the water and the wind takes them to a compatible other spore. But truffles put out a smell that mimics the sex pheromones of certain mammals. And so these, um, the, so then they dig them up they eat them and then they poop out the spores far away, which is a much more effective way of getting them away from their parent than just being a mushroom. Interesting. Um, I have another one here. It says, are, are there known, this is from uh, JD, uh, are there known issues uh, with growing in, and introducing exotic mushrooms into our native um, environment like you're doing the shiitakes right. right now that's a that's a good question um i have not heard of any pathogen mushrooms that people are worried about unless you're thinking about um ones like the chestnut blight um mm -hmm. Which, yeah, I don't consider that a, you know, one that produces fruiting bodies that people bring there for that reason, but that was an accidental release because in, on the infected tree that came, you know, from Asia to, I think it was a New York Botanical Garden, um, ended up, you know, spreading across the East Coast. Um, so I guess... I guess the answer actually would be yes, because there are certain uh, fungal pathogens that have caused devastation here. But I've never heard of it in like an edible mushroom that's brought here because it was a good edible and then it took over. But I do know that there have been wild strains of the shiitake found on Warren Wilson College campus um, because they were growing shiitakes as part of their farm. And the shiitakes actually moved into the woods and are growing wild now. So it can happen, but I haven't heard of that being a problem with, with mushrooms that were brought here for their edibility. Would it, like those shiitakes, would, that, is, would there be, I guess, do, um, do mushrooms compete with each other? Yes, they do. Absolutely. Okay. For, for growing and stuff like that? Yes, they do. And a more aggressive fungus will not allow a less aggressive one to take over. And that happens sometimes with my shiitake logs. If I have turkey tails grow, I'll have a log of turkey tails when I had meant to have shiitakes or a lion's mane or something. Not that um, turkey tails are bad. I can use them medicinally, but you can find them anywhere. So I'd much rather have shiitakes in my yard. So how, how, no. Okay, so if anybody has questions, uh, unmute themselves and go ahead and it's uh, through <laughs> the chat and um, ask. I see some people unmuting themselves. Bennett, did you have a question? Speak up and forever hold your peace. Could you could you go back to the initial slide, Julie? With my your, very first, my very first, that, the one that, that has your here. email on it that you uh, want. I'm going to go to the last one then because I put it there too. Okay, great. Because but, that uh, may you may want to show us a couple of those books too. But there, oh, oh yeah, that's a, that's a different would. email than I've just put it in. It is. There. It's and I know that's the one she wanted questions at. Right. Yeah, I, I, oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I've got like six emails now, 
And yeah. this is the one I use for nature stuff. <laughs> that was my trail name when I hiked part of the Appalachian Trail. But back to the books. Um, that's the movie that I recommended. So take a picture of the screen if you want to see it. But you can find it uh, on Netflix now and any other place. It, it's really good. I put a link to the um, trailer in the. Um, okay. In the and chat. if you want it, and um, you've got my whole PowerPoint. If you right. wanted to put it out there for people, there's a lot more on there, as you mm -hmm. can tell. Um, this book, Mycelium Running, gets into a lot of the uses of fungus for like buildings and myco remediation, you know, like cleaning up oil spills and stuff and regenerating forests more quickly and so many other things. What was that big thing that he was holding? <laughs> yeah, that's and um, um, that is a fungus that he thinks cured his mother of cancer. Oh, really? and yeah it's a very old mushroom yeah obviously <laughs> yeah i mean i mean yeah and that's some building uh, material that is actually stronger than bricks that you can grow you know it's just mycelium growing into a form you know you have a mold and you grow it there and then you can build with it and that's alive um yeah it sure is wow <laughs> Cool. <laughs> uh, you can, but then you can bake it if you didn't want it to sprout. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Paul Stamets. He's the rock star of the mycological world. <laughs> he owns a company called Fungi Perfecti, which um, you can buy your spawn from there for shiitakes and such. It's more expensive, but he has some pretty cool strains. Oh, I have to tell you about this. That is a picture under a microscope of the fungus strangling a nematode to eat. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I thought I had pictures of some books. Um, if not, I can just zoom to me and show you the books in front of me. There we go. This is my favorite book in the universe right now. Um, the Field Guide to Mushrooms of the Carolinas. Um, the three um, authors are, are, are very prominent mycologist and all of them are affiliated with the Asheville Mushroom Club, which is a really good club to join if you like to go on forays where you just go looking for mushrooms and, and you have your baskets and you fill them up and then you bring them back and, um, and someone like Mike Hopping, one of the authors, he's there and to put them in little um, paper dishes and he'll write down the actual species name of every one that we find. And mm. then we cook up all the edible ones and have a <laughs> feast. Sounds like fun. They're wonderful. There is actually, for those who might uh, want to know, there is actually a... Um, a uh, Charlotte uh, mushroom sure is. and I'm not sure a couple of them asked me for the link so I'm not sure if they're on or not okay cool. uh, but anyway. yeah so right. this is, is the um, yeah this is at the North American one of the North American Mycological Association um forays um which are like a professional conference for people who love mushrooms and they do the same thing but there's like a table for each family and there's a whole auditorium filled and then you have a mycologist like um Todd um um, yeah, Todd here, um, I just went, Todd Elliott, who is just absolutely amazing. And he'll go and talk about everyone that's in front of him um, for one particular <laughs> species. And he specializes in truffles around the world and cordyceps. But yeah, there's something else. Wow. Yeah, now this is a workshop by Ken Krause, um, who lives in Wilkesboro. And he did it at the Patterson Incubation School um, between Lenore and Wilkesboro. And that was an all day of workshop. You know, he like, you know, had a workshop first and then we went out and gathered, then we talked and then we cooked. So you can find that <laughs> happening in North Carolina too. That's Julie. Right. Yeah. yeah. A word to the wise. Um, when I was a medical resident in San Francisco in the early 80s, there were a few hippie types that went out foraging for mushrooms and thought that they knew what they were doing. They unfortunately mm -hmm. ate a bunch of Amanita phylloides and all died of fulminant hepatic failure. Oh, yes. Wow. 
I, I was going to get that was probably a, something I should have put farther up in yeah. my so um, my talk be uh, because <laughs> you do have to be careful. And what I said at the beginning about really learn which ones will kill you. Yeah. And do not eat any of them except ones that you are a hundred percent sure of. Yeah, you know, they're easy, easy to identify. But even something as easy as a chanterelle to someone who really doesn't know mushrooms yeah. um, can really get it mixed up with a jack o' lantern because the gills go down the stems and they are both sort of the same color. But this one is enemy number one, yeah. the destroying angel. Um, it will kill you within 48 hours, shutting down your um, organs, your liver, and your kidney. And yeah, these, these, uh, folk, these folks knew they were in trouble when their dog died. Yeah, and right now, more uh, dogs are dying from ammonita poisoning than um, people are because they're sweet. And this is what's scary about this mushroom. It's beautiful, absolutely glows like it's from yeah. another planet when the sun hits it, um, yet it's sweet. Those people who have eaten it before they died said it was delicious. <laughs> and it makes me think that the strategy for this fungus is to attract maybe um, mammals um, yeah. because it's preferred substrate or food is the organs of mammals. So be yeah. sweet be beautiful wow yeah Can I, another unrelated question um some folks have looked at corals um with uv light um has ah, anybody yeah. done anything like that with mushrooms in terms of glowing and so forth yes um i they, they actually under uv light some of them are absolutely spectacular oh somebody just put into um into the chat that there's also a, a mushroom club in Gaston and Gaston County and they um they do for it forays almost every month except that's great the, yeah the, uh, the, Facebook, the Facebook information cool. is in the chat I did not uh, and know I will about put them. that I will put those pieces of information out on the on the, the website when I upload the um whatever the things up that's great there's another club in the Winston-Salem area I think they're the triad um, mushroom club and they're pretty active okay all right um, I'm going to stop there you go <clears throat> Steve it's all yours well thank you Julie that was a terrific presentation <laughs> uh, great pictures great stories lots of good information we really appreciate that and I'd like to invite anyone who's not a member to join us. You can go to mechbirds.org and click on the word join. It's on the homepage right above our logo. And membership is $10 per year for a person, $15 for the family. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending our meeting tonight. And we can stay on a few minutes and talk if anyone would like to discuss anything else. And thanks again, Julie. Thanks. I enjoyed it. It was my first Zoom presentation <laughs> with mushrooms. Oh, <laughs> Did very well. There, we're getting lots of thank yous and wonderful and fantastic. Cool. You can look at the chat if you want. Yeah, I'm about to click on it. Cool. <laughs> hey, Julie, I have one last question. So okay, right the, ahead. The poisonous mushrooms, can you like get in trouble like by handling them in your hands without actually eating them? No, no, they have to be ingested. Okay, so there's only about... there's there's one mushroom that's an Asian mushroom that will cause dermatitis, but uh, all of the poisonous mushrooms here they have to be ingested to hurt you. Okay, what if you like licked your fingers afterwards or something? Um, probably not enough to um, to get into your system. Okay. And there's some, and there's some that are poisonous that um, would not hurt you if you cook them. That they actually the poisons in them are neutralized by heat. Um, and the one the jack o' lanterns and they're the false morels actually have a chemical very similar to rocket fuel, but very few people die of it because most people who gather mushrooms to eat know to cook them first, and so then they're not they might get real uh, an upset stomach, but they don't die. But that's not the case with the amatoxins and the ammonitis. Okay. Thank you. And of course, there's always a statement that all, all mushrooms are edible. 
Some, at least once. Some well, only once. <laughs> yeah. And you've got old mushroom hunters and bold mushroom hunters, but no old bold mushroom hunters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. I want to put my gallery on. Anybody else have anything to say? You're all still sitting there so nicely. <laughs> I, th I, th I thought that was only true of scuba divers. <laughs> <laughs> no, the same thing. It's both. Thanks, Julie. It was great to see you tonight. You that too, was Julie. wonderful. And let me know when you come up. Yeah. Same for you for down here. All right. Sounds good. Well, have a good night. Good night. I'm going to turn. Oh, I got to turn off. I stopped. Stop the recording.